The COVID-19 Immunity Task Force and CanCOVID have partnered on a monthly event series, Research Results and Implications, to offer researchers, policymakers, and Canadians with the latest COVID-19 related results. To learn more about how both organizations have been helping to inform public health policy during the COVID-19 pandemic, please visit our websites at covid19immunitytaskforce.ca and cancovid.ca. Thanks everybody for joining. We've uh, had to uh, negotiate a few logistic challenges with Zoom, but I think we're uh, more or less ready to go. So thank you for your patience. Um, uh, I'd like to begin um, uh, by um, just providing a few housekeeping notes. Uh, uh, my name is Tim Evans, and uh, uh, je vais uh, uh, donner quelques mots aujourd'hui. Uh, uh, but I'd like to give some instructions to our um, French attendees uh, so that they can uh, access the live translations, um, uh, and then we will uh, resume in English. Uh, Alors, on m'a demandé de partager quelques brèves instructions pour euh, nos participants français afin qu'ils puissent accéder aux tra traductions en direct. Euh, note à l'attention de nos participants francophones, euh, nous vous invitons à vous rendre au bas de votre écran Zoom où se trouve une icône ressemblant à une globe. Pour indiquer votre langue de préférence, cliquez sur ce globe et sélectionnez French. Dès que notre conférencier commence à parler, vous allez entendre notre traducteur. En tout temps, si vous souhaitez revenir à la version anglaise, vous n'avez qu'à cliquer sur le globe et à sélectionner Off. Uh, de plus, vous verrez qu'une version française de la présentation a été partagée dans le chat. Si vous désirez suivre la présentation en français uniquement, uh, alors toutes nos présentations aujourd'hui présenteront en anglais. Alors, uh, we'll just make sure that uh, our, all those who are listening in French uh, are able now to access the live translation. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone, and uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce our moderator today, Dr. Upton Allen. Uh, Dr. Allen is the uh, Bastable Potts Chair in Infectious Diseases Research, a professor of pediatrics at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto, a senior associate scientist and chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Hospital for Sick Children, and interim head of the Transplant and Regenerative Medicine Center in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Uh, thank you, Dr. Upton, for lending us your time today. Um, I will now virtually hand over the mic uh, to you. Uh, Timothy, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed for the kind introduction and for your help in setting up the French attendees with the live uh, translation. I must say welcome to everyone. Uh, on behalf of the CITF and Can COVID, the, this is the first installment in their new seminar series, Research Results and Implications. Our topic today is on risks and impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on Canada's uh, kids, their parents and teachers. Uh, we'll focus on the latest research results, uh, policy implications that are associated with these uh, data. I'd like to add that you uh, don't have to wait until the end of the presentations to get your questions in. You can simply enter them into the chat and we will ensure uh, that we ask our speakers as many of these questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, reintroduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Timothy Evans. Uh, who is the executive director of the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Uh, he will be sharing with us today a brief overview of the CITF's areas of research focus and the associated studies. Tim, over to you. Thank you very much, Upton. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so uh, just to uh, remind people uh, that uh, the uh, COVID-19 Immunity Task Force was established uh, in April 2020 uh, uh, with a mandate to support uh, relevant research uh, that uh, from across the country uh, that would be helpful uh, to federal, provincial and territorial decision makers uh, in better understanding uh, infection and immunity in the response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Next. Uh, the, there are a number of areas of priority research for uh, the, the uh, task force, which uh, have evolved over time, uh, but uh, initially uh, to really assess uh, the level of infection uh, as measured by background um, or previous infection. Uh, through uh, antibody testing uh, to understand fundamentally the nature of the immune response to infection uh, and to make sure that we had uh, reliable uh, and accurate uh, tests uh, to understand uh, levels of immunity. Uh, and then more recently, as vaccines have come on board, uh, is to really understand the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. So uh, with that next slide, uh, over the last uh, 18 months, 20 months, uh, we've uh, uh, supported 108 uh, studies across the country uh, that correspond with these uh, areas of priority. Next. Uh, today, we're going to look at uh, a number of studies that have been focusing on children, parents, and teachers. And uh, all of these uh, speakers will be introduced today, but that gives you a sense uh, that they really span across the country and have been working together really to bring uh, uh, a greater uh, than expected understanding than either of these studies might have been do, able to do on their own. Next. So uh, there are a number of unanswered questions regarding uh, SARS-CoV-2 and children and the settings in which they live. Uh, they relate to infection in terms of the numbers infected, uh, uh, why they are less likely to get seriously ill than older age groups, uh, but nonetheless, some do get seriously ill and how do we understand who's at greater risk? Um, how do we protect from infection? Uh, what are the options, uh, the, the various non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, as well as uh, uh, the uh, environments in which children find themselves both in the house uh, and in school uh, and what are the prospects uh, for vaccination in terms of risk and benefits for these children, their parents, uh, families and their teachers. Uh, so uh, we think these are very timely in the, uh, given that it's September, uh, schools have reopened, um, uh, we have a, a Delta variant driven uh, fourth uh, wave, and uh, we have uh, the prospect of vaccines uh, being extended to children uh, under the age of 12. Uh, so there are a tremendous number of answers for which uh, we think some of the evidence presented today uh, will be helpful in informing uh, best policies and decisions um, uh, for Canada uh, to protect their children moving forward. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, hand back over to Dr. Allen. Oh, Tim, thank you very much for providing that overview. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Megan Azad, uh, an associate uh, professor of uh, pediatrics and child health at the University of Manitoba and a research scientist at the Children's Hospital Research uh, Institute of Manitoba. She'll be presenting on the child cohort study. Megan, um, welcome. Welcome, thank you very much, Dr. Upton. It's a pleasure to be here today to present some of our um, preliminary findings from the child COVID-19 study. Um, so as you can see, the study involves children from across four provinces. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here representing the very large team of researchers and of course the many families involved. You can see a contribution from Kristen, one of our eight-year-old participants up in the corner here. We actually had an art contest for the kids involved in the study um, last spring, which coincided with the first um, shutdown of schools and got some really neat entries. You'll see a few more of them in our presentation today. So the child study uh, 
predates the pandemic by about a decade. This is a national pregnancy cohort study that began um, back around 2010 when we recruited pregnant mothers with the intention of following them and their children and their families over time to understand the genetic and environmental factors that shape health and disease trajectories. So we were actually, um, we've been collecting all sorts of data, um, questionnaires about nutrition, stress, the home environment, we've been collecting biological samples um, since before these babies were born. Um, and we were uh, midway through our eight year follow up in um, early 2020 when the pandemic occurred, we had to shut down all of our clinical assessments and sort of rethink what the study would look like in the coming months and which is now turning into years. Um, but we realized at the same time that we were disappointed our study was being interrupted. We had um, an important opportunity and perhaps even a responsibility to use this um, platform that's been funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research over the past decade to really use some of this um, treasure trove of data to understand how this lifetime of data experiences and exposures uh, contributed by these families might explain things about the pandemic, um, the influence of COVID-19, of being infected, but also um, the influence and the experience of living through the pandemic and the stress and resilience um, that comes along with that. So we applied to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research um, call for research on COVID-19, and we were fortunate to be funded in that competition um, by CIHR as well as by um, CTIF. So we're happy to be here today um, speaking along with the other studies funded through that um, organization. And so uh, our plan for this research was really to combine uh, pre-existing data from the child study. Um, and this includes over 12,000 individuals. So we had about 3,500 families participating in the study, including children and parents across these four provinces. And like I said, we've collected a lifetime of data on them, including things, um, biological components of their immune system and their microbiomes, and also information about social factors, the environment, and so on. And then the opportunity we had here is to combine all of that information over the past decade with new information to be collected during the pandemic. So we've been collecting um, bi-weekly uh, questionnaires by text message where families are reporting this yes or no if anyone in their family has um, been infected or been tested for COVID. And then we have some longer surveys every few months about experiences during the pandemic. And we've also done um, a seroprevalence survey having families contribute a dried blood spot sample um, collected at home and sent into the lab. And then we really have two goals with this information. One is to study the direct impact of infection, so whether that be symptomatic or asymptomatic. And then secondly, to study the indirect impacts of the pandemic, so focus on, focusing on things like social isolation, food insecurity, stress, and so on. And then unlike any other research we've done previously in the child study, um, we have a real sense of urgency to rapidly translate this information to the end users, whether that be policymakers, um, people planning about school closures and so on. And so we have a group of knowledge users that we meet with every month from the pu public health agency of each province um, and also the public health agency of Canada to make sure that we're feeding back our results and we're also hearing from them and able to adapt our surveys um, in real time to ask questions that are the most meaningful. Um, and I won't focus on this today, but we see also an opportunity to study the impact of the pandemic today on the future health of these families. They've committed to a long-term study. Um, so long as we can continue to be funded, we hope to be following them many years into the future. And so we'll be able to see sort of the biological and psychosocial imprint of this experience on their health trajectories going forward. So a couple of very quick results. This shows you the number of families and households participating in the study and the age distribution of the, the participants. So we have a spike around 10 years old because that's the age of the children who were recruited 10 years ago. Um, but we also have some older and younger children, which are the siblings. Um, and then we have a spike around 45 years of age, which is the mean age of the parents involved in the original study. But again, there's a spread. And so altogether um, to date, we've had 153 cases of COVID in the study. Um, so 2.9%. And here you can see the distribution um, stratified by children and adults in the study at the four different centers. So the highest prevalence has been observed among adults at the Edmonton site at 5.5% and the lowest among children at the Vancouver site. Um, so a little bit of results from our surveys. Um, this one asking about changes in children's daily routines. Um, so you can see here um, different activities, probably not surprising to many. Children are using more media, both for school and non-school reasons. They're also um, spending more time with friends remotely. Um, and then in terms of things children are doing less of, they're spending less time with friends in person um, and also getting less physical activity, which is potentially a concern. Um, 
We asked children about their perceptions of stress and anxiety and loneliness during the pandemic um, and found that about a third of them report being restless or fidgety um, and also about a third reporting being irritable or easily angered. Um, and this is of concern to our child psychology um, colleagues in the study because it can be sort of a sign of, of behavior problems and potentially um, impacts in that area. Um, slightly fewer, around one in five children worried about mental health, feeling lonely or anxiety being reported. I don't wanna leave on a negative note though, so I wanna point out that we did ask um, parents and families about any positive outcomes they've perceived from uh, living through the pandemic. And we did find that um, the majority of families, up to 80% in Vancouver, reported um, at least one positive outcome from the pandemic. Um, and so the most commonly reported positive outcome was spending more time with family. We also had some people reporting getting more exercise, starting new hobbies, eating healthier. And then there was um, an interesting sampling of other responses and um, reading through these was interesting. So some families reporting saving money, um, having more free time, having improved mental health. So we saw um, good and bad on, on that issue. Uh, several people reporting new pets. So some interesting things there that we'll probably follow up with our next survey. And so um, what's next? Uh, a lot. So we are working um, to understand how different public health measures are associated with um, SARS-CoV-2 infection at our different study sites. We're starting now to ask a lot of questions about vaccine uptake and um, attitudes towards vaccines. We are looking to um, link with CANU data, CANU being the Canadian um, Urban and Environmental Health Network. So looking at um, weather data and movement data, linking that to our data in the child study um, and really focusing on the psychosocial impacts. Um, so if you're interested in more results from the study, we are making an effort to post them on our website. So you can go to childstudy.ca slash COVID rapid results. Um, and you can see some of the data I presented today, plus more um, in our effort to get this data out while it's still timely and useful. Um, we're committed to updating that page fairly regularly. And I wanted to give a shout out to the key people in our team that have done a lot of work to um, make that a possibility. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight that we're really proud to be featured along with many of the other studies you'll hear from today in the Children's First Canada report on the top 10 threats to childhood in Canada, focusing on the pandemic. So um, really recommend checking this out if you're interested in learning more. Um, and finally, a thank you to the people in my lab um, at the Child Study and our collaborators for this COVID work. Uh, it's a huge team effort and many people have been working very hard all year uh, to collect these data and get them shared in a timely manner. Um, so thank you very much to the team and our funders. And I will hand it back uh, to Dr. Upton. So thank you very much, uh, Megan. Um, that was uh, great work. Um, and thanks for sharing this uh, with us today. Uh, I'll now move to uh, Dr. Jonathan McGuire, a colleague here in Toronto, a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto, a scientist with the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions in the Likishing Knowledge Institute at St. Mike's Hospital here in Toronto, and a pediatrician uh, at uh, St. Michael's Hospital. He'll be presenting on his work at Target Kids, uh, and we do look forward to your presentation, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Dr. Allen. Next slide. Uh, so uh, I co-lead Target Kids uh, with Dr. Catherine Birkin from the Hospital for Sick Children. And Target Kids is a primary care practice-based research network. So what that means is we do research in collaboration with healthcare providers. And so we do research in healthcare providers' offices, and we see children who are being cared for uh, by healthcare providers every single day during the process of receiving healthcare. We started this back in 2008 and developed a cohort of children uh, through the practices. We have now uh, just shy of 12,000 children involved in Target Kids, and we're in 14 large group practices uh, across Toronto and now in Montreal and Kingston. Next slide. When the COVID pandemic hit and our practices were largely shut down owing to the physical distancing policies, uh, we, we pivoted Target Kids to study how COVID was affecting children and their families. And you can see here on the left slide is the Target Kids participants and on the right side is in Toronto, the COVID hotspots. And, and our children are from many of the, the highest risk areas in Toronto uh, for COVID-19. So we thought this was a, a really important thing to study for our families. Next slide. So we, we, we wondered about how COVID infection uh, and now vaccination is impacting the health, well-being, and learning of children and their families. We uh, offered families serology tests done by finger poke. 
uh, to, uh, to figure out if they've been exposed to COVID-19. Uh, we've been following vaccination of children and their parents, and we've conducted surveys. We do, uh, we've conducted surveys every other week uh, for COVID infection and COVID symptoms, and surveys less frequently on school problems, school performance, and how families are doing coping with, with COVID-19. Next slide. So this became the COVID, Target Kids COVID-19 Study of Children and Families, which we launched in April 2020, thanks to the uh, funding from the CIHR and the Canadian Immunity Task Force. Uh, we've involved 1,021 families and 1,345 children. And we now have back uh, just shy of 600 COVID serology tests, and we've received over 10,000 surveys uh, from our participants. Next slide. So here's the, the study population, at least for the children. You can see these are, these are quite young children. They've been followed by target kids since birth. So uh, the youngest here is in your birth and the oldest is about 12 years of age now uh, with a fairly uh, uniform distribution across the ages. Uh, next slide. In terms of seropositivity between April 2020 and July 2021, 12.6% of parents were seropositive and 2.8% of children were seropositive. Next slide. In terms of COVID vaccination, 10.6% of parents received their first dose and 3.4% of parents received their second dose, at least up to July of this year. And no children have received COVID vaccination because children under 12 are, are largely uneligible for COVID vaccination. Next slide. We asked parents about what they thought of vaccinating uh, themselves and their children. And what you can see in this chart here is the, the red line is parental responses and the blue lines are uh, child responses. So what parents thought of the vaccine for their children. And uh, on the left side is we strongly agree with COVID-19 vaccination. On the right side is we are unconvinced about COVID-19 vaccination. And 3% of parents were unconvinced for themselves and about 8% uh, were unconvinced for their children. Uh, so it looks like we have some work to do at least with a, a minority of families to, to turn the tide on that. Uh, their perceptions of the vaccine for, for kids. Next slide. We've also tracked adherence to public health guidelines in quite a detailed way. For example, staying at home, limiting visitors in your home, avoiding contact with others, keeping distance and so on. And what these charts show are that the parents on the left-hand side and the children on the right-hand side, and the lines represent how many days per week you are compliant with the various measures. And what you can see from this is the lines sort of go up and down corresponding with the various lockdowns that happen in Ontario. But the children's lines, they go more deep. And what that means is children Children had a harder time with following the distancing policies that uh, uh, were, were in place uh, for, for, all, for all of us in Ontario. Next slide. And so how has the pandemic affected children and their families? We know through a series of publications now that socioeconomic factors have affected families' ability to follow public health guidelines. We know that adherence to public health guidelines was, was, was different uh, by uh, 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 socioeconomic status. We also know that it resulted in lower outdoor playtime for those who adhered uh, to the guidelines more strictly and higher screen time. And we also understand through a really amazing collaboration uh, with the uh, uh, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists at the Hospital for Sick Children led by Daphne Kortzek, that social isolation has impacted children, children's well-being in a major way. Next slide. As you know, during the pandemic, children's screen time went up because they were doing screen, using screens at home for school and, and for social communication. The mean daily screen time for these kids, remember these are young children, was 2.8 hours. And we found that higher screen time was associated with higher irritability in children under the age of 11 and hyperactivity in children four to 11. Video game time, higher video game time was associated with higher hyperactivity and higher e-learning was also associated with higher hyperactivity. This is unpublished data. Next slide. And how has COVID-19 affected school? So at the beginning, when, you know, at least in Ontario, parents could choose between online and uh, in-person learning, 75% of our families chose in-person learning and 25 chose remote learning. And I think what's, what's really quite interesting is there is a, an income gradient in this, this choice. Uh, from the right uh, figure here, you can see that 61% of children of higher income families chose in-person le learning, whereas only 46% chose remote learning. Next slide. 
I'd like to thank everyone on the Target Kids team, all the healthcare providers and the wonderful scientists that I work for and the opportunity to present to you today. Thanks very much. If you'd like to learn more, next slide. If you'd like to learn more about Target Kids, you can visit our website uh, right here. Thanks a lot. Great work, uh, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, you, you've touched on some key areas there, um, the adherence to public health guidelines, um, impact on children uh, on, on children and their families, um, screen time. Uh, so lots of key issues um, for us to continue to work on. So our next uh, presenter is Dr. Mani Shadarangani. And he's an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia and the director of the Vaccine Evaluation Center for the BC Children's Hospital. Manisha will be speaking about the spring study uh, in British Columbia. Manish, the virtual podium is yours. Thanks, Upton, for the introduction. And, and thank you to the CanCOVID team and the um, immunity task force for allowing me to share our study data today. Um, so the next slide, so the spring study, just first to highlight what the name stands for. So it's essentially SARS-CoV-2 prevalence in children and young adults in British Columbia, um, an observational study. And, and the real aim overall of the study was to try and get um, a true handle on the infection rates of SARS-CoV-2 in the young adult population and the pediatric population across BC. So the next slide, please. So the, the design is um, four separate cross-sectional snapshots over a 12 to 18 month period um, during the pandemic. So these are separate time points taken to look at the infection rates across the province and then any individuals identified as COVID-19 positive to then follow them up over the study period. We're really targeting across the province, mostly healthy children, but children with medical problems have not been excluded and would be trying as much as possible to be representative across BC in terms of the geographic distribution, um, the sex and the ethnicity of our study participants. The study criteria are relatively simple, so it's slightly different to the two studies that you've already heard about. These are not pre-existing cohorts that we have been doing this work in. These are new studies, um, a new study with new study participants being recruited. So either the, the participant themselves or the parent or guardian gives, con gives consent or assent under 25 years of age and resident in BC and, and no one specifically was excluded. And as you've heard, similar to some of the other studies, the samples that we were collecting using dried blood spots, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, um, and using a, a well-used um, panel to look at SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in the lab. So on the next slide, please. So this just shows um, one of the posters that you, we use to advertise the study. And so once the, the child or the parent um, has, or the young adult, um, it recruited and enrolled into the study and signed the consent form. They received a survey through the a red cap, so an online survey that they can complete um, in sections if they like, but essentially can be done from home. And then we would send them a kit where either for the older kids and for the young adults, they can collect it themselves. And for the younger kids, the parents collect it, um, but a few few drops of blood from, from the finger for the very young infants from the heel put on a bit of filter card um, and mailed back to us. And then those can be analyzed in the lab. So everything could be done remotely without people having to leave, leave their homes. So next slide, please. So the first snapshot on the data I'm going to show you today um, were collected over the winter of 2020 to 2021 up to early March. We were targeting a two and a half thousand people altogether with at least 500 in each of the, these five year age bands shown here. Um, we ended up with just over two and a half thousand and at least 500 in each of those age bands. And then we did get samples returned from the vast majority of, of people. Some people were unable to collect the samples, which we were anticipating and had taken into account in our sample size. Um, most of the samples were collected um, up to the during the sort of late winter, early spring, but mostly during January to March. So it's important to bear, bear in mind where we were in the pandemic when these samples were collected. And the sort of second snapshot is currently in progress and we've almost completed enrollment for that. So we're hoping to have some good data of what has changed um, to the summer of this year. So on the next slide, please. 
So I can show you the sort of main main data from the, the antibody results. It's showing you the overall rates of um, seroprevalence, so positive antibodies in these different age groups. And I think, so two things I think for me to take away from these data is that all the way up to these first four age groups, so the under 20s, it's pretty much um, stable. So the black line shows the overall estimate with the gray um, the gray shaded area, the sort of 95% confidence intervals. So it's around 4%. So we identified around 4% of people had antibodies to COVID-19 um, at the time of sampling. So at the time that these, the study was done, if you looked at the, the BC COVID-19 dashboard, in the under 10s, the, the rates of infection were around 1%, and in the 10 to 20 year olds, around 2%. So you can see by measuring antibodies um, that there were a, a number of um, either very mildly mild infections or asymptomatic infections that were not being detected through um, the routine testing clinics. The other thing that I find really interesting from these is that if you then look at the 20 to 24 age group, which we knew even from the testing data, they have a slightly higher rate of infection. So again, at this time, it was around 3% of this group were thought to have been infected, but the rate in our study is around 7% in this population. So higher than, than the younger age groups, um, and again, higher than you would expect based on the testing data. And I think these data are really important as we go forward, as we've had vaccines available for adolescents, and as we anticipate vaccines in this younger age group, you know, all of the complications that we've seen from COVID-19 in children so far are with this, you know, at least up to March of this year, this relatively low proportion of the population who've actually been infected. So next slide, please. The other piece we did also, like the other studies, um, ask people about their confidence in COVID vaccines and their intention to get COVID vaccines. And again, these were before COVID vaccines were actually available for children. So for the older children and the young adults, they answered the survey themselves. And for the younger kids, the parents answered it. And overall, um, around three quarters of individuals said that they intended to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. 7% um, had already decided when they answered our survey that they did not want to receive a COVID vaccine. And there was a great area in between of the undecided. What was interesting is that the real facilitators we found to increase confidence in vaccines are people who were confident about the safety and, you know, and understood the benefits of the vaccine. Um, and the, the BC Provincial Health Officer was identified as really a, a really trusted voice. Um, and a lot of reliance also for COVID vaccine information came from direct friends and social networks. So on the next slide, you can see the actual data from this for people who are interested. So there's a lot of data in here and a lot of different elements we looked at, um, but on the right-hand side, in the, in the multivariable analysis, you can see that people that were concerned about vaccines were much less likely to want to get the vaccine. People who had a positive attitude towards the vaccine thought that COVID was a bad disease were more likely. Um, people who thought that getting a vaccine was essentially a social norm, so this was the, the normal thing to do, um, were more likely to, to want to get a vaccine. And again, highlighting that the provincial health officer in BC and friends were really crucial facilitators. Um, and in terms of getting the public health messaging out there, these are important important um, modes of communication to, for us to try and leverage. So on the next slide, please, I just want to give a huge thank to all the investigators. This has been one of many collaborations we've done with the lab here at the Children's Hospital and BCCDC and also the math department. Um, specifically, also a huge thanks to um, Helen He, who's the coordinator for the study here at the VEC, and the entire research staff at the Vaccine Evaluation Centre, who've really been working flat out over the last 18 months on this study and, and many other COVID-19 studies. And of course, none of this would be possible without the overwhelming support and enthusiasm of all of our um, study participants. So huge thanks and, and thanks to the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force for also supporting this study. So thank you very much. Wonderful, Manish. Thank you so much. Uh, great work. Our next speaker is Dr. Kate Zinzer, an assistant professor at the Col de Santé Publique at the University of Montreal and a researcher at the Center for Public Health Research. She'll be presenting on the Etude on Course study. And Kate, uh, the podium is yours. Wonderful. Merci. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'll be presenting uh, the Encore study, which is a cohort of children, uh, two to 17 year olds, who were recruited from four different neighborhoods in Montreal. And these neighborhoods were selected to reflect different sociodemographic profiles and COVID-19 burden. We also collected a cross-sectional study on school and daycare staff. And the primary aim is very similar to the other studies, is to estimate seroprevalence. And for the cohort, we also looked at seroconversion. 
And secondary objectives included understanding the impact of COVID on daily lives, uh, mental emotional health, as well as vaccine uptake and hesitancy. Next slide, please. For the methods of our study, it includes an online consent procedure uh, followed by an online questionnaire. And afterwards, we sent an in-home dried blood spot collection kit. And this is for the serology testing. And the participants mailed in their dried blood spot to our lab. And then they were notified of the results, including the interpretation of the results. And currently, we have collected two rounds of data collection and are planning for a third round for the end of October. Next slide, please. So here I'm presenting the results for both rounds of our data collection in children. The first round was from October to March uh, 2021, and it's a longer uh, collection period because we were recruiting at the same time. And the second round was from May to August 2021. And the results, we'd like uh, you to note that these are preliminary results for round two. So the average zero prevalence from round one was 5.8%, which increased to 10.1% with round two. And here you can see it broken down by age group. And we did it relative uh, to if a child was eligible to be vaccinated or not. Um, and we can see that the differences between the age groups from both rounds with an increase in round two across the three age groups, although the smallest increase was in our 12 year olds and older, which is likely due to the vaccine. And with round, with round one, we were able to calculate seroconversion with a 6.9% for positive seroconversion which means that these participants were negative with the first round and positive with the second round of collection and a 5.5% uh, negative seroconversion. So these were participants that were positive with the first round and were IgG negative with the most recent round. Again, these results are preliminary and we're currently exploring this to understand some of the underlying characteristics uh, for negative seroconversion. Also five, five of our children uh, were reported to be hospitalized for COVID and four children had COVID symptoms that lasted three to five months. Next slide, please. The graph on the left is showing our seroprevalence estimates for round one. Uh, given that it was a long enough recruitment period, we could estimate seroprevalence over time. And what you see behind uh, the points for seroprevalence, the blue, this is showing the confirmed COVID-19 cases for Quebec. So it's not surprising that our seroprevalence uh, is increasing over time, given what we're seeing in terms of case burden. And uh, we obviously need to update this graph to reflect our most recent results. In addition, we are also testing household members of newly uh, seropositive cases. And the household positivity is quite similar between the rounds. We need to update our figure for round two. This is caught off the press from this morning. Uh, so for round one, it was 11.2%. And for round two, it's 12.9%. Next slide, please. The good news is that the large majority of our parents are supportive of getting their child vaccinated. At the time of when they responded to the questionnaire, 44% of eligible children were vaccinated. And of those not yet vaccinated, 84% are likely to get vaccinated. And this is something that we're monitoring is uptake versus intention. And the younger the child, the more likely a parent is to be hesitant towards vaccine. In addition, we found that racialized parents and those born outside of Canada were less likely to report intending to vaccinate their child. And the top reasons for parents who are unlikely to vaccinate their child are not enough information, being concerned about the side effects, and uh, believing that if their child gets COVID-19, they won't become seriously ill. Next slide, please. And in terms of lifestyle impacts, we have similar findings to that of other studies. For physical activity and spending time outdoors, we have broken it down by age group, uh, what we see here, our parents are reporting less physical activity, which is the blue color, compared to pre-pandemic. And for ages eight and above, there's quite a difference. Almost 70% of parents are reporting less physical activity compared to the pre-pandemic period. And we're seeing a similar effect for time spent outdoors, which is particularly notable for the older children. We've also found that with 90 minutes or more a day of social media use, it was significantly associated with psychological distress. In round two, we had a short questionnaire just for teens, and we compared the teens' responses to their parents' responses who were reporting on behalf of their teen on different dimensions of their emotional and mental health. And you can see here that parents are often underreporting different dimensions compared to their teen, except for anxiety, which was quite similar. One aspect that's a bit uh, amusing is irritability. Uh, it's reported to be higher in parents than their own teen. But overall though, uh, there's a high prevalence across the different mental and emotional health items. Next slide, please. 
Here are our preliminary results from our staff cross-sectional study, which was conducted from March to August. The overall seroprevalence was 7.2%, with the highest seroprevalence in staff in primary schools. There was a high level of vaccine uptake based on our most recent data, and we'll be following this up in the fall for those who were not fully vaccinated at the time of the questionnaire. We also looked at emotional mental health, including burnout, and you can see here that there's high fatigue among school and daycare staff, with about 20% of the respondents feeling burnt out. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we have trends of seroprevalence increasing over time with our study population with a larger increase for children who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. We also see that there's IgG waning over time that for those that were originally seropositive. Uh, there's a double vulnerability for children with parents who are visible minorities as they're more likely to be seropositive and may likely to be less to get vaccinated. Uh, this is parents reporting to be less likely to accept vaccination. Daycare and primary school staff have higher seroprevalence compared to children. Uh, generally, there's high levels of vaccine acceptance among study participants, and there's important implications uh, from COVID on physical activity, uh, less time spent outside, as well as increased social media use. And in terms of updates for us, we're currently working on a data collection for October. Uh, and because of some of the vaccine hesitancy results that we found uh, with uh, a colleague, Britt McKinnon, we are now developing a vaccine hesitancy project in Montreal to improve inequities in vaccine acceptance. And we're also um, soon to be following up a subset of seropositive children. Next slide, please. And I would really like to acknowledge the wonderful study staff and co-investigators, Britt, uh, Carolyn Quash, and several others that have been fundamental in getting this project up and running, uh, including children and parents uh, and all the different days, daycares and schools and school boards we're working with. Thank you very much, Dr. Upton. Thank you, Kate, uh, for providing uh, an overview of uh, the seroprevalence uh, study of SARS-CoV-2, Quebec, the vaccine acceptance uh, hesitancy is a really, really great work. Our next speaker is Dr. Brenda Coleman, who is a researcher at Mount Sinai Health System here in Toronto and an assistant professor at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And she'll be presenting on the study of the epidemiology of COVID-19 in teachers and education workers. Brenda? Thank you very much, Dr. Allen. My pleasure to be here. Um, this is, we affectionately call this the uh, COVID cohort study two, which stands for teachers and education workers, TEW. Uh, next slide, please. So if I talk about the CCS, that's what I'm talking about. So um, we, uh, the whole idea, like most of the other people that are, have talked so far, is to look at the incidence of SARS-CoV infection and the risk factors associated with that infection. We are also looking at the psychological impact of our teachers and other education workers having to work during this pandemic and all of the stress that they've had to go through doing stuff online and then offline and then back online and both. Um, we want to look at the changes in the anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies over time. We're following these people for up to a year. We are also looking at their intent to be vaccinated and um, as well as their actual vaccine uptake, um, looking to see what we can find out about uh, the incidence of reinfection, whether we have enough to say anything or not. And um, when we wrote this, vaccines weren't available. And uh, as we all know, they are now um, and teachers have mostly been vaccinated. And so we will look as we can at vaccine effectiveness estimates. We started recruiting on February the 18th. And as of November the 10th, we had um, over 3000 teachers and other education workers in Ontario only um, is the only province that we went um, to because of the problems with working with the school boards and all the rest of it, not the problems, I shouldn't say the problems, the uh, challenges of working with school boards and other things. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, education workers, whether they be teachers, janitors, bus drivers, we were um, inviting all education workers who were 18 to 74 years of age, who worked for um, eight or more hours a week for any Ontario school or school board. So they didn't have to work directly in the school. They could be a school board employee as well. And that includes everyone from psychologists who go to different schools to uh, you know, um, maintenance staff. 
So as with most other people, we've done everything online. Um, so they go online and do their consent and then do questionnaires. Um, they do a baseline at enrollment. And then we've asked them because of the new school year to um, redo that if they um, enrolled before September the 1st to tell us what's going on in this school year. Every second week, they um, also do a short questionnaire um, so that we can look at time varying exposures, whether they've been exposed to people, yes or no, and what sort of um, activities they've been involved in. Um, they do a questionnaire if and when they are symptomatic or have been tested for COVID. And um, every 13 weeks or so, we get them to do the K-10 so we can look at their psychological distress levels to see whether they vary over time. We ask them to collect uh, self-collect um, blood spot samples at enrollment um, at various points around their vaccination uptake. We, are, we have most of them 30 days after their second dose, and then we're collecting them again every 13 weeks thereafter to look at trends across time. Those samples are sent to the National Micro Lab to be tested for um, antibodies to the spike, the RBD, and the nucleocapsid. Next, please. So um, we've done a couple of analysis and I presented um, one of them here that's been sent off for publication, um, looking at the cumulative incidence of COVID-19 uh, during the first 18 months of the pandemic. Um, for this, we had uh, 2,800 participants with a mean age of 45, as expected, most of them were female, most of them were in a teaching position, which meant teachers or um, teaching principals with teaching um, duties. 59% of them worked in an elementary school and um, just over half of them at the time of this had received two doses of the vaccine. We found the cumulative incidence of infection, whether that be by self-reported um, respiratory sample or um, sero serologically, 3.6% uh, was, was about equal to what we were finding across um, different studies in Ontario for adults. And the risk factors, probably not a big surprise to people, was direct exposure. Um, this, uh, the highest risks were in um, exposures to household members, and that in most high, highest incident ratio, ratio to um, adults in the house, um, but also significant were children in the house. Um, others included students. Um, that they were exposed to that they knew had been tested positive for COVID. Now, one of the things that we talk about in our um, discussion is the fact that they're less likely to be exposed to someone in the household. So really those risks um, at school, even though the incidence rate ratio was a little bit lower, um, they're more likely to be exposed you know, exposed at school. The other thing that um, is not surprising, given the fact that we were um, looking at uh, the incident, the, anybody who was infected since the beginning of the uh, pandemic were, was travel outside of Ontario. I, um, I have a master's student who is working on um, looking at uh, psychological stress using the K-10. And even though it's not listed here, I will give you a sneak preview that 22% of the teaching staff had, uh, were rated as having high psychological distress, which um, marries very well with what uh, Kate found in uh, Quebec. Younger staff were more likely to be stressed than older staff. Those who rated their um, self-rated their health as being poorer were more likely to be psychologically distressed. And those people who had concern for their own or their family's health in relation to COVID-19, as well as those who rated the social distancing practices of their uh, peers and the students at the school where they worked as being lower. Although it was not statistically significant, um, those who were unvaccinated also had slightly higher um, psychological distress levels. Uh, next, please. So um, despite fairly high vaccination rates, um, we think that it's really necessary to continue protective practicing like mask wearing, physical distancing, et cetera, throughout the next months or years of the pandemic including, and I think this is important for people to think about the close contacts like people at home who have been exposed. 
Um, and I think that's one of the things we, we uh, need to remind people about is that um, if someone else is in your household has been exposed, you should be practicing some uh, protective practices. And I know that's really hard to do. I know I would find it hard to do. So uh, messaging that's going to be tough. Next. So I'd like to thank our study team, Drs. Robert Monder, John Kim from the National Micro Lab, Sharon Strauss from Unity, Susan Bondi from um, the University of Toronto, and Dr. Allison McGeer. But I'd also like to say thank you to Christine Mesa from uh, the National Micro Lab and to Kaylee Fisher, our uh, study coordinator. Brenda, thank and you so much for sharing this um, data with us. Um, you know, we're very pleased that you've been able to uh, share this uh, information. Our uh, next um, speaker is Dr. Pascal Lavoie, an investigator at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. He's a pediatrician and an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. He will present on tracking COVID-19 for safer schools. Pascal? Pascal, are you there if you're muted, perhaps? Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, I was thanking you, Dr. Um, Allen, and also the CITF organizer for, for making this event possible today. Uh, so I was instructed to limit methodology slides. So I posted the link to our uh, first preprint uh, for our, our school data on, uh, on the chat uh, earlier. So uh, you can find more details there. Next slide. So our study uh, is a collaboration between uh, Vancouver Coastal Health, uh, several Vancouver uh, school, dis uh, school district in the Van great, Van greater Vancouver uh, uh, area. It's called Tracking COVID-19 for Safe for Schools. Uh, if you just want to move down to the first uh, line. So our main objective was to determine the seroprevalence of SARS-CoV-2 infection among school staff. So it uh, had been, um, they, they had been concerned that uh, possibly the documented reported COVID cases among the school community was underreported because a number were of the uh, teachers uh, or uh, infected people were asymptomatic. So this the main component of this study was an antibody uh, detection component. Also, our, our secondary aim was to look at vaccine uh, perception and mental um, uh, health of, of the school community. And we also uh, collected data about uh, COVID distancing uh, practices and, and risk exposure and so on. So if you want to move down to the next. Um, so our study involved three school districts, the Vancouver School Board, Delta and Richmond, which are located south of, uh, of Maine, Vancouver. Next. And we had serology and questionnaire and school staff. And next, we also reviewed uh, as of now, uh, COVID case data from uh, the close to 50,000 students and 7,000 staff. So all of the population of the Vancouver School District. Next. So the serology was conducted in a subset of school staff uh, close to 1,600 between February 10 and March 15. And I'll show you how this correspond to cases in BC. At the time, um, our sample we show in our preprint, it was representative of the whole population at exactly the same uh, incidence of reported viral, positive viral testing. Next. So you see here, um, the darker black line is the uh, cases in all Vancouver uh, school, uh, the Vancouver district in all staff and student, the, the sort of, uh, uh, paler gray on top is all cases in Vancouver, so all Vancouver residents. So the lighter gray, uh, which is sectioned by a red line with, when we conducted serology testing for this particular study. So you see it was uh, be after the first sort of main three waves, just before the 
the last uh, wave in BC. In for for the Delta and Richmond uh, school district, our serology testing was conducted uh, mostly after that last wave, and I'll I'll show the data in the next slide. Next, please. So. Key results, first thing we noticed is there was a really high perceived risk and mental stress indicators among the school staff. So more so than we would imagine and more than we had uh, measured in other study in health workers. So teachers are really under stress and feel that their uh, exposure uh, to COVID is, uh, is high. And that may not be surprising because 21% of our uh, survey school sample reported a close contact with a COVID case, either a student, a coworker, or a family member. Now, uh, 60, a little over 16% of those contact felt to have occurred within the school setting. So that's 278. Of those, uh, we had 24 uh, confirmed um, uh, infection by viral testing. And of those, five have likely acquired infection in school as to their impression when we surveyed there in public health uh, uh, investigation. So it's really, of all the exposure, it's really a really small number of, of exposure that end up being infection in schools, but it, they do happen. Um, next slide. So when we use serology testing uh, to account for asymptomatic infection, we, we detect another 45, 46% uh, more. So about we double that uh, infection rate. So in the end, in, our, in the Vancouver School District, the adjusted seroprevalence at the time was 2.3%. So that is comparable to uh, community seroprevalence in, um, that have been reported in, in a few other studies. Um, uh, in our uh, preprint, we compare uh, the data to a, uh, a weighted uh, geographically age and sex and time period weighted uh, group of blood donors. And it turns out that blood donors may not be representative of the whole population, but they're represented there. Uh, we found they're a good representation of the school population. So, and that zero prevalence was uh, slightly lower, though it wasn't statistically significant, but certainly not higher than the blood donor group. In the Vancouver, in the Richmond Delta School District, we just, our sample size is smaller. We just completed analysis and we find a zero prevalence of 4%. This is preliminary and we haven't, uh, compared this to community, but remember also it was sampled later after that large wave of infection in BC. Next slide. So in conclusion, we, find, we found no detectable increase in seroprevalence among school staff of these school district above uh, the community. So these findings to us confirm that in-person schooling is possible uh, uh, in the context of mitigation measure and uh, widespread community transmission. So really the lesson we learned from this is we, we got to make every effort to limit community transmission to protect the school system, um, which includes uh, vaccination and things that are already happening so that our children can have access to an education. Next slide. So uh, just a few uh, words about our vaccine data. So 92% um, of teachers in our sample felt that they wanted to get vaccinated and 82% felt it was urgent that they get vaccinated soon. And this again was in back in uh, February to April. Next slide. And so when we uh, analyze the different answers to the question and try to come up with a construct, we find that the, uh, uh, the authority recommendation is the strongest predictor of wanting to get vaccinated. So it's really, so for teachers, expert opinion is very important. But we also found that people need to understand the pros and cons of vaccines. And uh, we need approach to try to counteract misinformation and support health literacy in general and uh, ed educate people about their uh, real susceptibility uh, exposure to COVID. Next slide. So I'd like to 
stop here by thanking the uh, tremendous team, uh, including School of Public Health, Vancouver School District, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health, Public Health in BC, UBC Department of Statistics, Mathematics, and, and, B, and, and our big team at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. Next. And of course, this study was funded by the CITF. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascal. That's um, really great work. Um, now that uh, brings up our final presentation today, which will be done by my friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Kellner, whom I've known for about a hundred years. <laughs> um, Jim is a pediatric infectious disease specialist and a professor of pediatrics at uh, the University of Calgary. He's a member of the uh, CITF leadership group and Jim will speak to us about vaccines, synthesis, and policy implications. Jim. Thanks very much, Upton. Um, and uh, I am uh, pleased to be here today. And I first want to say um, uh, thank you to all the investigators who presented data today. Um, thank you very much both for your informative presentations. Um, but uh, moreover, thank you to you and your colleagues for having pivoted your uh, scholarly focus to the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, taking on the challenge of investigating the pandemic to inform both Canadians and the world and so that we might better respond to the pandemic and, and do better from the start next time. So next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just going to sort of summarize a little bit of what I heard and uh, what we knew, like had a chance to review the slides beforehand, and then talk about the bigger context of things and then uh, finish uh, with sort of what are some of the policy implications before we get into the question and answer. So if you look through the, uh, uh, the studies that we heard from today, um, some of the sort of summary points. Uh, first, that acquired immune response from COVID-19 infection remains low among Canadian children. Uh, so vaccination and mitigation measures such as mask wearing and other public health and public safety measures remain essential. Um, also, um, although school staff have feared acquiring uh, COVID-19 infections through school contacts, mitigation measures seem to have worked really well, at least in some settings, um, as few have been found to, to, to acquire um, uh, COVID-19 through school contacts. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the other uh, key findings around first mental health and well-being? Um, and many of the studies uh, focused on this helpfully. Uh, In-person schooling is better for the health and well-being of most uh, children's teens and parents. That may be um, uh, sort of need to go without saying, but it's been very helpful to sort of reaffirm that. Up to 80% of children and youth uh, surveyed increased their non-educational screen time during the pandemic. Um, Almost all children and youth spent less time uh, doing physical activity. And then as well, parents experienced high levels of pandemic-induced stress and anxiety, and that was reported from several of the studies. Next slide, please. So how about vaccine confidence? Um, most parents and teachers agree that vaccination is important. Most parents intended to get their children vaccinated when vaccines became available to them, and we had questions that were asked, uh, um, you know, sort of before widespread implementation of vaccines earlier on um, uh, in the winter and spring. Um, key facilitators to increase vaccine confidence focus on vaccine safety and benefits. Uh, 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 the leverage uh, that comes from having trusted voices. Um, and um, the discussion of the importance of encouraging individuals to promote vaccination amongst friends and social networks. Next slide, please. So what are the implications if we think of the broader context of COVID-19 in children? And, um, you know, these are really helpful data that we heard here today. And I just want to make a few general comments uh, about uh, the, the broader context. And um, the, uh, the first is that we know globally that severe COVID-19 infections in children are uncommon. Um, and uh, there's a low risk of hospitalization, intensive care admission, um, and uh, the clinical feature of myocarditis after getting COVID-19. I just bring that up because it comes up with vaccines. There's an extremely low risk of death um, overall. And there's, uh, it, it seems that there's a lower risk of post-COVID conditions. Uh, where testing is abundant, the, uh, however, uh, one thing, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, where testing is abundant, the proportion of children diagnosed with COVID-19 is proportionate to that of the local population. So in my own province of Alberta, where about 20% of the population is, is under, uh, is 
aged 18 and younger. Almost 20% of all the COVID-19 infections that have been diagnosed in Alberta um, have been in that age group uh, because there's been a you know, sort of abundant testing approach. And I think it's important in that setting to say that, you know, in settings, you know, we have more data now and you say in settings where vaccination rates are low and where public health measures are not widely in place, the number of children with severe outcomes increases as an absolute number. And we see this from the United States and um, the, uh, the, uh, the references that I was to put in on these slides to haven't appeared at the bottom, but uh, there's an MMWR report from a couple of weeks ago looking at um, the U.S. states by quartile and vaccination and vaccination rates by quartile, and in this in the states with the lowest quartile and second lowest quartile of, um, of vaccination and accordingly also of public health measures, you see a significant, a, a, a five to eight fold increase in the likelihood of an emergency visit or an admission to hospital. And we've heard these stories of full pediatric intensive care units in some um, um, tech, you, you know, US states like Texas. Um, and that's, so although the absolute risk to a child is low, if enough children get infected, there'll be an absolute increase in the number of children who suffer severe consequences of COVID infections. Next slide, please. So then what about the schools? And a lot of discussion about the schools here are really helpful on the data that we have. Helpful to remember that, and we know, and you know, this came out from the WHO early on, that um, regular school experience was disrupted for over 90% of the children on the face of the planet, early, at least early in the pandemic. Since then, school closures, online schooling have had a variable impact. And I think an important thing really in the Canadian context this school year is that there's highly variable public health and public safe, uh, safety measures in place across the country. Um, there's uh, different approaches to expectations of vaccination of uh, uh, teachers uh, and staff and volunteers. Um, and uh, there's variable uptake of uh, vaccine in, in age eligible, eligible children across the country. Uh, public safety measures such as masking, hand washing, limited class sizes, reduced mixing and gathering, staggered schedules, and so on, are highly variable across the country, both between provinces and within provinces. And then as well, there's variable approaches to testing, contact tracing, and outbreak controls, uh, um, with um, that still being maintained strongly in some areas and not in others. Next slide, please. And so then uh, broader implications regarding vaccines. So. Um, as we've heard, the expectation and the uh, anticipation and the intention to take vaccine um, by uh, teacher, staff and volunteers uh, was generally high. Um, but what we'll see over time is that uh, the actual uptake of vaccines uh, by adults in the children's uh, lives um, will influence the safety of schools this year. The more teachers, staff, and volunteers who are vaccinated, the safer the schools will be. It's not just vaccination, though, it's the public safety measures, but that's such an important part of it. Then, when it comes to children who can be vaccinated across the country, uh, uh, children and um, adolescents so, uh, from the age 12 and above, of course, being vaccinated uh, with, um, with uh, variable uptake across the country, but in general, good uptake, but in the sort of 50 to 60 range, so children, um, 50 to 60 percent range, and so children um, um, are sort of in that age group under 45 across the country that is the lowest um, uh, vaccinated uh, age cluster across across the country. And so uh, there's a lot of anticipation about vaccination for younger children. And we know there's the announcement that one of the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine, it released um, some uh, very high level data about its um, benefit in, in younger children. And they've submitted to the FDA for approval in the US and expect that there be submission to Health Canada soon. So a couple of things about vaccine for children, though, is that it's not automatic how the next steps are going to be. So we do, uh, you know, what will happen with um, the use of vaccine in younger children depends on our evolving knowledge of the benefits versus the risks. And there's been a lot of discussion about that, and there should be. Uh, it depends on regulatory approval and what that would look like. While it, um, there will be the effort to do it um, appropriately rapidly, it will not be rushed, and um, there will be the need to make sure that as much information is available as possible before regulatory approval comes. Advisory recommendations 
there's different possibilities of how advisory recommendations may go. Uh, vaccine availability could become an issue. There's abundant vaccines and the mRNA vaccines at the usual adult dose, but um, many people know that the doses being tested in children are lower doses, so that would mean different formulations. And then what will be the level of public interest? So the next slide is my final slide. Just about then some policy uh, implications uh, related to all this. And I think uh, the thing to say here is that, um, you know, first, Delta and other uh, variants of concern, but especially Delta, has highlighted that continued uh, mitigation um, measures are, are necessary um, uh, uh, across the globe. We know that there's no country in the world that vaccinated uh, highly enough to um, prevent the, um, uh, a significant impact of uh, the uh, Delta wave and that the combination of vaccination and whatever public safety measures that are in place um, makes a big difference to how it's played out. And we see dramatic differences. My own province, Alberta, is undergoing a brutal fourth wave um, because of the abandonment of any public health measures and, so, um, and not enough vaccination. And uh, so um, that continues to be an issue. Uh, although vaccine coverage is very high across Canada overall, it's uneven, leaving pockets of people not adequately protected, um, regions within provinces and some provinces. Um, so vaccines will be important for children under the age of 12. And what does that mean? It'll be important however it goes. Um, if it goes the way that the vaccines are readily approved and, uh, and recommended and taken up for the uh, children under 12, that'll mean a much bigger chunk of the population, that 15% of the population that's under 12 will, will start to be able to be protected themselves and contribute to the overall number of the population who are, are vaccinated. If it goes the other way where vaccine ends up not being approved, it's not a given that it will be approved for use in, in children under the age of 12, then it'll highlight the importance of ensuring that as many um, adults as possible um, are, are vaccinated to, um, to optimize the overall proportion of the population that's, pop, uh, that's vaccinated. And then maybe it will just be the case that sort of some of the higher risk children get vaccinated and, and that'll bring, bring its own set of, of sort of considerations there. But however it goes for vaccinating children under 12, it'll have important policy implications. And so then finally, although the intent is to vaccinate children was high in these studies, <clears throat> It'll be important to continue to monitor vaccine coverage and all levels of vaccine-induced um, immunity, as well as safety, um, to ensure safety uh, for all involved in the educational sector. So um, those are the end of my um, overall comments. I'll turn things back to you, Upton. Thank you very much. Jim, thank you so much. That, that was really wonderful. And that leads us to the uh, uh, Q&A session. I know that uh, many of you have put questions in and you can continue to do so. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Why don't I take the, uh, the position of uh, the privilege of the chair to start with the first question um, that I'll direct at um, Manish. Um, perhaps uh, Manish, in, in very briefly, can you just um, give us an overview of um, the various um, uh, serology testing modalities. Uh, you've used one approach in your studies. Are we looking at apples and oranges or different types of apples? Um, yeah, so, so I think there are, I think it's both the platforms, but also the way the samples were collected. So I think certainly for our study, we used the dried blood spots as some of the other studies did and used the MSD platform, which measures multiple SARS-CoV-2 antigens. So the spike, the RBD and the nucleocapsid as many of the other presenters mentioned, but also other coronavirus antibodies. I think specifically around the samples, you know, for, with some of the work that we have done um, and I'll let other speakers comment on their own sort of internal validation but certainly we we know from dried blood spots the sensitivity of that analysis of those samples is lower so if there are people with very low levels of antibody they may not be detected so i think i would regard at least for our study our seroprevalence estimates as a, a low end of what the true rate actually actually is um, and then i think you know right now this is not a sort of Health Canada approved commercial assay. So there, there are certainly other assays that are likely to be more sensitive and more specific, um, but we're really trying to, it's a bit of a balance, right? So I think for the study, we're trying to answer multiple questions. We're trying to, I think for our study, it was really important to be able to um, be able to reach out to the entire population of BC. And it was very, it's very challenging to get venous blood from, from children. So I think that's important for a lot of the pediatric studies um, and get access to a lab. And so 
in trying to be inclusive, we've sort of decided to sacrifice maybe some of the um, the perfect essay, if if you if you like. Um, but yeah, and I'll let others speak to the platforms and the approaches that they have used. Manish, thank you so much. Um, uh, let, let's move to the next question. I know there, there are other um, uh, platforms, but at least to, to highlight the issue of differences between different platforms, I think you brought that out. So um, the, the next question, perhaps I'll direct this to, to Jim. Uh, how can we be uh, certain that uh, there aren't long-term implications of COVID among children? Uh, essentially, the, the overall burden of long COVID in children. Can you address this, Jim? Yeah, so I think that um, it's a really important issue and uh, one that uh, continues to evolve. And, you know, part of the concern uh, with children is that, um, that's analogous to adults, is that in, in adults, it's, it's getting more uh, well established that you can get long consequences of COVID without having had significantly symptomatic disease. So long COVID doesn't occur just in people who are hospitalized with severe disease. It can occur in people who had minimal um, uh, symptoms. And so because so many children who have had uh, COVID-19 uh, positive tests have had, you know, at least a third are asymptomatic um, and, um, and two thirds, most of those have mild cases. So that's, that's where the concern comes from. Um, it's important, the way that we're getting there with, with data is to have sort of large scale studies and uh, there is work going on in Canada. Um, they're uh, um, probably the best source of data overall globally so far is coming from the UK where there's some uh, large scale uh, uh, surveys that are, are looking at um, the duration of symptoms that occur after COVID, any kind of symptoms with a control population. And this is really important because so many of the um, kind of symptoms that occur after long COVID, um, you know, there's the severe things like shortness of breath and respiratory and cardiac problems that are like a sequelae of having had severe disease, but then there's more non-specific kind of symptoms related to fatigue and concentration and other things that are symptoms that can occur even if you haven't had COVID. And so it's really important to be looking at control populations and saying, how does what's happening after COVID differ from what would have happened um, in, in control populations? And so I think we're getting there to understand that the risk is real um, and, um, and um, the exact prevalence, I think we'll get a better sense of in that you know, sort of coming time, but um, it's it's some of this large scale work going on in a variety of settings, including some Canadian work that'll inform us better in time. So another question that we have relates to the pros and cons of uh, vaccinating children. So the essence of this is um, uh, why uh, push vaccination for children uh, if, if uh, vulnerable adult populations uh, have already been vaccinated. Um, who would like to take that? Um, perhaps, um, uh, Jonathan, you wanna take that one? Sure, absolutely, Dr. Allen, thank you very much. This is an excellent question. The, the, the theme of the question is, you know, children aren't, you know, affected, don't seem to be affected as much as adults in terms of disease from, uh, from SARS-CoV-2. So why vaccinate them? And I think, you know, you sort of take a step back and say, you know, if we don't vaccinate our children, then the most vulnerable people in our country to COVID-19 is going to be all of our children. And I, that's an inequity that I think is probably not acceptable to most people. So I, you know, I think the push to vaccinate once we have a safe and effective vaccine is a really important one to protect our kids. You know, as Dr. Kellner was saying, you know, there may be long-term issues that we just don't know about yet from, from infection. And uh, you know, it'd be really good to prevent those. And um, you know, a safe and effective vaccine could certainly do that. And that also underscores you know, it's the many cohorts that have been going on for many years and are going to continue to follow these children for many, many years to come. So we can find out, you know, what uh, what worked and what uh, was less successful. No, that's that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, there's another question that relates to the wearing of masks. Um, jurisdictions outside of North America, some uh, do not wear masks at schools um, and uh, transmission um, uh, among schools um, is, is low. So um, why do we conclude that mask in children is an important intervention? Would like to take that. Jonathan, you want to give that a step? 
<laughs> sure, I'm, I'm happy for others to pitch in too, but back, you know, masks have been shown to be successful in many different um, populations and in many different uh, exposure groups. And it, you know, it seems quite reasonable that they would also be uh, quite successful in the school environment. And there's, there's research to support that as well. So I think that's a, a prudent thing for the schools to be doing at this point. This is Brenda speaking, and I'm pretty sure there was a study that just came out of the US um, last week, I think it was, comparing schools that had masks and those that didn't, and the ones with masks had fewer infections. Great. The, another question is, are there um, any studies on um, the, the sustainability of antibodies um, for those who have had virus um, uh, and who have had one vaccine or been doubly vaccinated or a combination of infection and vaccination? Um, Tim, do you want to comment on that? You're muted. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll go. Yep. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, so, sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, the studies uh, that have looked at uh, the duration of uh, immunity. Um, I'm familiar that, the uh, especially in the context of vaccination, uh, but I, I have seen some data which suggests that uh, the children do uh, uh, develop uh, robust, long-lasting immunity um, in general, but uh, uh, others may have uh, more precise information on whether or not there's waning either post-infection or uh, post-vaccination. Anyone who wants to add anything? Yeah, uh, sure. I'll just add briefly that, um, I mean, you know, this is an evolving story as the, as the pandemic goes on, uh, because before the pandemic, there was virtually no data. One study from the UK and uh, uh, volunteers to the Common Cold Unit in the 1990s, uh, looking at du duration of, um, of uh, immunity after being exposed to uh, coronaviruses. And, um, you, you know, so what we're seeing is uh, studies that um, are accumulating, looking at the, in, 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 in very high detail at all of the aspects of the immune response, both the antibody response as well as cellular immune response, and then others that are just looking at antibody responses after you've been infected. And those studies are out to uh, eight plus months now. Um, but we're going to see over time, as time goes by, we're going to see uh, what that looks like. It For sure, it looks like if you've had a... Um, uh, as, as an adult, if you've had a um, COVID-19 infection uh, with or without significant symptoms, that you're likely developing a pretty, if you're otherwise healthy, middle-aged person, developing pretty robust immune response um, that lasts uh, for several months. Uh, however, it's variable. And this is one of the things that comes up is why aren't we just fine after we've had um, uh, uh, an acquired infection, it's variable. And so even within the range of normal healthy people, it's variable what that uh, response and duration looks like. And if you have um, uh, underlying health conditions, then it's variably going to be lower, uh, the response that you have. The combination of uh, vaccination plus, uh, of, of, of infection plus vaccination is another thing where the data is accumulating. And on balance, there is um, evidence, good evidence showing that you are better protected if you've had at least one dose of vaccine after you've uh, been um, had infection. And so time will tell, you know, we're going to know, we'll be much smarter about this a year from now when we have, to have a re reprise of this uh, uh, presentation because we'll have accumulated that much more data. Um, but, but on balance, yeah, you get protection after uh, disease. You probably get broader and deeper protection after uh, disease and vaccine. And and you get um, and you get uh, good protection after after vaccine, and we'll probably need additional doses of vaccine over time. Um, the the fine details of that are evolving before our eyes. Thank you so much, um, Jim. Let me let me um, direct the next question to to Brenda Coleman, and this um, relates to um, uh, testing in keeping schools open. Uh, what role can testing play in this regard? So um, I think that it's, it can be very important given that our children cannot be vaccinated at this point, that testing is the only way we're going to be able to tell whether there is transmission within the school. So I think it's a very important thing to do and we need to con um, continue doing it in those schools that are doing it. Even the um, 
of the rapid tests are way better than nothing. And I really suggest that people continue to be tested, uh, especially the children and unvaccinated uh, workers. Great, thank you. So I'm watching time and I'm watching questions. And so what I'm gonna do, uh, if I may, is to ask um, Kate to just um, leave us with a, a key talk, take home message from your work. And I'll do the same for Pascal. Sorry, right. with Kate. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think a key take home message is that it's important that we continue monitoring seroprevalence especially with a um, high vaccination coverage in younger children to see the evolution of the virus and the transmission. Um, and also to really think about all of the unintended consequences of the impact of COVID on our children. You know, I think at the beginning, we were all worried about the clinical impacts of, of COVID, which are obviously very important to continue monitoring, but there have been a lot of other, you know, unintended consequences for this population as well. Excellent. Let's move to Pascal. Yeah, I agree with Kate. Uh, so far, our experience has been that there's been very little, uh, relatively low secondary transmission of cases in schools, but things have the change. Uh, we're moving in the next phase of a pandemic with the Delta variant and, and vaccination and so on. And I, I think it'll be really important to continue monitoring uh, to uh, make sure that we can adapt interventions um, to, to, the, to each uh, particular uh, jurisdiction in school settings. Thank you so much. And Megan? Yeah, I think agreeing with the previous speakers and what I'd add from the perspective of the child cohort study, and this probably would also apply to target kids, where we have existing cohorts that were around before the pandemic, um, there's a real opportunity to leverage that data to understand how some families have shown more resilience to the pandemic and the stress um, and how others haven't. I think that can teach us a lot about um, how families are coping, how they we can support them in coping with future pandemics um, or stressful situations. So all of that requires ongoing monitoring um, into the future. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, let me thank you all on behalf of the CITF and can COVID. I'd like to thank the speakers today. Uh, this, this is really wonderful. Uh, let me encourage you to attend the uh, second seminar in the series, which will be held in late October. The topic will be on long-term care. Uh, CITF and Can COVID will be announced in that event um, uh, via their newsletter and on social media shortly. So stay tuned for more information. That concludes um, today's uh, event. Thank you, have a wonderful day. We would like to thank today's speakers and attendees for their time, as well as the members of our networks for their continued support and participation in Canada's pandemic response. If you are interested in attending our monthly research results and implications events, please visit either website for more information.